Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can see that now. Um, OK, so yes, um, I'm going to be demonstrating how you upload a model onto Daphne and then go ahead and run that model using a workflow. And uh, so to give you a bit of context, this is the COVID-19 COVID sim micro simulation, which was produced by Imperial College London. Um, and essentially, I've chosen to use this example because it's fairly topical, I suppose. And also, it is a good example of how Daphne can be really useful. So if we click into here, for example, there's loads of files to get your head around. If you wanted to run this model, it would be probably quite difficult for your average person, unless you're a technical user, then you might struggle to uh, run this model. So hopefully, I'll demonstrate today how Daphne can help that. So if we go ahead uh, and log in to Daphne, uh, we come to our front page and Beth has already shown you the data section of the site, uh, but I'll go ahead and show you the models section. Uh, so this is all of the models that I can see on Daphne and I can click through. And there are some familiar models at the end that came out of pilots. So some of these Brian showed you the outputs of earlier. Um, but if we go ahead and want to upload our new model, then we can go ahead and click add model. And then we've got um, reams and reams of documentation on how to actually do that process. So um, if we click on here, you can see how you have to write this model definition file. Um, and then if you click over here, you can read all this information about containerizing your model. But essentially, when you upload your model to Daphne, you need two things. Uh, one of those things is your definition file, and that explains all of the metadata about your model. So all of the input parameters, all of the output files, all of the data files that go into that model, um, but also stuff like the description, the person who created it, uh, the title, that kind of thing, all goes into this um, definition file, which is all documented here in terms of how you actually go about creating that. Uh, and then what you need is uh, a Dockerized version of your model. So uh, Docker, which Brian briefly mentioned earlier, is a way of packaging up a selection of code uh, so that it can be run anywhere. So you can kind of think of it like a shipping container uh, so that you put all your stuff into it, you ship it off, and then it arrives at the destination. And when you take things out on the other side, they're all the exact same. So it's essentially uh, creating a good way to port your code across to different platforms and uh, Daphne, is, Daphne is using Docker behind the scenes. Um, so all of the models that come onto Daphne have to first be Dockerized. Uh, so the process that I've gone through with that COVID-19 model is essentially to go ahead and take that code, download it onto my, my local machine and produce this Docker file. Um, so that's a, a bit of effort at the start for someone that's more technically technically minded, but then hopefully you'll see that once that initial bit of work is done, it should be then easy for any user to come along and run that model. So again, as with uh, Bethan's example, you can read the terms and conditions, etc., read through all the documentation, but now we're ready to upload our definition file and our um, Docker image. And then you can just click add model. Now we're not going to wait for this to complete because it'll take quite a while to upload. So I have already done this process and the model has finished uploading and it's live on the platform. You can click through into here and read about all the metadata of the model. You can read some more about the input parameters that it takes. Um, the actual model itself on GitHub is takes way more parameters than this, but it, it would be a case of porting each one across uh, individually in that definition file, which I didn't have the time to do. So I've just ported across a few more that we'll look at in a minute. And then you can read through all the output files that come out of your model. Uh, so then once that model's available on Daphne, it's only available to you. You can then choose to share it with whoever you want. You can make it public so that anyone on the platform can use your model. Uh, but by default, it's only available to me for now. Um, and so then if I go through to workflow. So workflows is how you actually then go about running those models. Uh, you can have workflows and workflow instances. So workflows are this sort of base workflow that you set out as a template with all your parameters, the way you want to run the model, if you want to link into any other models. And then the workflow instance is actually the completed version of that, of that model run, essentially. Um, so if we go and look at create a workflow, we have to put in some metadata, like the display name, um, workflow name, a summary and description, but we'll sort of fill that with dummy data for now. And so now you come to your workflow builder page, and this is where you can add steps to your workflow to actually be executed behind the scenes on Daphne. So if we click the add button, 
you'll see that we have um, four options down the bottom of different steps that we can add. One of the steps is the iterator step, which we're not going to use at the moment, but that will essentially allow you to iterate over the same model um, thousands of times and incrementing a certain parameter by one each time or uh, changing something by uh, a scale factor or whatever each time. Uh, the only um, iterator type that we've got at the moment is Monte Carlo, but in the future we probably will be adding more to that. Um, but then we can go and select our model. So this is the model that I uploaded earlier. It's got the same metadata that I've just shown you. And we can select that, uh, call it COVID test or something. Um, and then down the bottom, we can change parameters. So these are all the parameters that uh, I've ported across in that, my definition file. It, there could be hundreds more on here, but I sort of just did this for demonstration purposes. But you can choose things like the country name, We'll stick with the UK. You can change the R number, which has obviously been talked about a lot in the news recently. You can change the household level compliance with quarantine. So this is how many people um, are actually obeying the rules on a household level, um, which apparently was 75% in the study that they did, but you can change that to be whatever you want. Uh, and then you can uh, change the case isolation as well. So how long people are told to self-isolate after they have experienced COVID-19 symptoms. Um, so uh, we'll just go ahead and create that step. But you can see how then I could go in and add another model to this workflow and then I could start chaining models together to do system of systems modeling. Um, so you could have the input, the outputs of one model going into the inputs of the next, etc. And you could, you know, end up with a, a, a long chain of models that run a really complex scenario. So you can imagine how the COVID model might be linked into a, a model about households because um, the movement of people or the uh, deaths, et cetera, associated with COVID-19 might then affect the household price, the house prices or other parts of the economy, which we know it's already doing. So you can see how you could interlink models to get a more accurate picture uh, at the end. Again, we're not going to do that today just because of time reasons. So um, there's then two more steps that I can choose to create. I can use a publisher step, which would essentially take the outputs of the model and put them into the data catalog that Beth has just shown you. But because she's already shown you, that's probably a bit boring. So we can then instead create a visualization step. So we can do test biz, and then we get a choice of visualization types. Um, this, we, at the minute, we only have Jupyter notebooks to choose from, but in the future, we expect to have more drag and droppable things. But I'll show you what happens if you create a Jupyter notebook visualization. Again, there's a load of metadata to fill in here um, because it outputs your data still. Uh, so you need to associate some metadata with that output data set. Um, but essentially, that's how you go ahead and create your visualization step. If I were to create this workflow for real, it would look something like this. Um, and you have all of this proper metadata in there. You have to specify the files that you want to put into your visualization at the end. Um, but I think this workflow took something like an hour to run, so I'm not going to rerun it now. Uh, but if I were to, I could just click execute here, execution started, and you can see my uh, new workflow down here has started and it's uh, running. And I can go ahead and click into there and see these two steps are waiting to be completed. But again, Blue Peter style, here's one I did earlier. And these, these steps are both clearly completed because they have the, the tick next to them. So I can click on this visualization step and click this visualize button. And this will now take me to our Jupyter Labs interface. So this is a, an external piece of software, um, but it allows people to write Python and R scripts to visualize or do some data processing on their data at the end. Uh, you can also spin up consoles in Python or R or just a regular terminal kind of thing. Uh, if we click through into data, you can see that those poor output data sets that were in the model definition have actually been outputted here. And we can, if we wanted to, click into there and explore an Excel file in a terrible tab format. Um, but we don't want to do that. We want to create a nice visualization. So instead, uh, we could create a, a R script, something like this. Um, so this is one that I borrowed from that same GitHub repository that I showed you earlier. Uh, so it's quite a lot of code in here. And obviously that a non-technical user might struggle to write something like this, which is why we want to provide more visualization options in the future. Um, but this is a good, it's still a good thing to do for now because um, it allows our more technical users to go in and do some uh, data post-processing. Post um, so if you click run on that, 
it'll run through the script and generate some nice graphs of some really morbid statistics. Um, so this is the example use case that we've run through our workflow. It's output some data and now we've written some R code to uh, do some graphs of that data. Um, and so you can see there's uh, various, di various different plots, which I'm not going to go into in great detail, but uh, hopefully that gives you a good overview of how you can use Daphne to make your model much more um, workable by a non-technical user. As we add more and more visualization options, it'll become easier and easier for users to go in, run your model and see some outputs from it. And also it enables people to explore what models are already available on Daphne and see if that's useful in their own research as well. Um, so that's all I really had for demonstration purposes. I'm happy to go into questions, I guess.